Edward, congratulations on this most well-deserved recognition. Your practice has informed and inspired me and so many privileged audiences around the world. Our long walks in old Montreal, deep in conversation during the long months of the pandemic resulted in the short film Echo. What an extraordinary opportunity to watch you create in such close proximity. I'm so inspired by your clarity of vision, your uncompromising dedication to precision and detail, and your ever-evolving innovation. I deeply appreciate our friendship spanning decades. I look forward to the next adventure. Thank you for sharing your creative genius. In the mid-1980s in Montreal, uh, there was a lot of crazy stuff happening on stage, both in the uh, dance world and in the theater world. But the, the greatest uh, enfant terrible of them all was, of course, Edward Locke, who seemed to constantly be working outside of the box, reinventing everything, um, rebellious, uh, delinquent, uh, rule-bending, gender-bending. And I remember at the time uh, seeing his shows and thinking, my God, if you want to get somewhere, maybe... Maybe you should get your act together. Because I knew that under all this delinquency, there was so much dedication, so much so much work, and so much discipline. It's really been fascinating for me to uh, follow Edward's uh, evolution as a world-class uh, choreographer. Nowadays, I integrate a lot of dance in my work. And uh, I've worked with some classical dancers. I've worked with some contemporary dancers, some street dancers even. And there's always a kind of point of friction in the work where dance and theater have to cross uh, boundaries. And uh, the solution uh, is always outside of the box. And I always think of Edward in these moments. And I know that, uh, like him, you know, if you want to do original work and if you want to do good and exciting work, you have to have the courage uh, to put yourself in danger. One day, a destiny named Edouard Locke knocked at the door of my vagabond life. A mysterious gesture. For how could I have foreseen that, when, like everybody else, I had been left mesmerized and speechless by his first creations? Tamvoli, Remou, Le Nageur, La Maison de Ma Mère works that sent him instantly in the Underground Hall of Fame. Edouard, ce nom prémonitoire that sounds so lovely in French, you almost have to say it in a whisper. Luck, like a strength added to keep the mystery of his talent, his genius for dance and more. Edouard Luck, c'est un nom a marqué d'une pierre blanche. En studio, with his voice, suave, his gaze and his rare intelligence, he manages to create a new order of the world made of different textures and complexities. He seems also to see beyond the silhouette of the body. He seems what, to see what we do not see, the soul perhaps. I've worn his dances, but above all, I've seen him create them. Wearing a leather jacket or an elegant coat on his back, calm, almost nonchalant, he entered the studio and movements arose from him. Uh, fast, new, seductive, fluid movements he danced like no other, drawing arabesque of ink spun in space, mysterious like thousand-year-old trees. Quite simply, he looked like an alchemist there in front of us. Watching him dance or create with the other dancers, I almost thought that he was inventing them, as if he had a gift to visualize and bring to light their potential and their true essence. Edouard loves his dancers and proves it by sculpting and meticulously and with precision, refined and complex dances for each of them. His dances give us dancers a power and it's really fantastic, to, fantastic uh, exaltation to perform them. It gives us also the possibility to travel far towards ourselves or towards others. C'est un voyage sacré, it's a sacred trip that I did thanks to him, with him, avec toi, Edouard. What I say here, ce que je dis, ce que je ressens, ce que j'aime, Edward knows it already better in dance steps, sweat, commitment, and laughter. Edouard, you are in the Hall of Fame since ever. 
which is really nice that today they make it officially official. Enjoy the party. Let's welcome Edouard Luck. Bonjour tout le monde. Hi everybody. Just give me a moment to light my pieces of paper because this light isn't strong enough. I'm going to use my iPhone. Uh, there's an old saying in the boxing world, you've got a plan until you've been hit. And uh, there's an old saying among speech givers, you've got a plan until you've been complimented. Um, so I began, the, my choreographic career began in, um, in a month. Some, um, how long was it? in 1974, so that brings it uh, to 49 years. And 50 years is um, automatic congratulations. 49 is on the edge of it. But there still is shared between that 49 and that 50 years um, a whole bunch of memories. And I think memories are something that everybody here um, has uh, preciously held. And I want to talk about the environment and the terrain that we all share, and that's common to dance, and that frames these memories. So here we go. Many in this room have shaped dance or been shaped by it to some degree. We've been in this life more than the other. Returning to a time when we first voiced our interest and felt ourselves meandering on the edges of this art form can date back quite a while, the terrain prior to this one only symbolically remembered. For some, an early start, remote from the world, apart from those people and circumstances that were needed at the time of their youth, still remembered today, but viewed and filtered through the dancing years. Others, at the start of their adult lives, surprised and unmoored from their plans and habits by a chance encounter with dance, until it no longer felt normal to not have it in their lives. The twist from the former path onto this one was sometimes abrupt, sometimes planned and methodical, but in all cases, lives were adjusted to it. Years can drift by that way, but the artists we work with remain utterly present in our minds and untouched by those years. The studios in which the beginnings of work occurred remain a pristine terrain 
housing nomads. Long ago, societies were nomadic, changing environments as they traveled. That's no longer the case. Now we change ideas. Same thing, same kind of terrain. And how unpredictable that terrain has proven to be. The utter vulnerability of the participants, both dancers and choreographer, each letting their knowledge pour out of them at the start, midpoint, and end of their work. Their hopes, fears, habits, encased in a fragility born of years of sacrifice, years and decades, sometimes extending past the midpoint of a life. Whether classical or contemporary, company or independent, it doesn't matter. All worked long and hard. And for those younger to this world, seeing the ones that have preceded them as they search for their own futures is another link to the generational history of this art form, unwritten but handed down through example and memory. Stepping into a studio to begin a new work marks a moment when something will be crafted from an idea in a way that I've yet to fully understand. Months later, structured, costumed, made up, and hoping to touch, include, mystify, seduce, and cry on the shoulders of an audience the artists have yet to meet is a fascinating thing to see. I believe it's the oldest way in which thought and the privacy of ideas can be sent from one human to another. Some say the oldest way is through music. I say I disagree. I'm convinced it's gesture, expressing a complexity beyond the appearance of the one presenting it that is the most ancient of the two. In this frail loneliness adapted to a modern, technologically sophisticated world that still exists in the studio, it is that process that remains utterly relevant in a modern world. Two groups of strangers who have never met and who will never meet again, one on stage, the other one on the seats, exchanging intimacies and vulnerabilities. Yet in those few hours, audiences will develop an empathy towards a point of view that was not theirs at the start. And that to me is fascinating. We are connected electronically in this world, but rarely are we together in the same room. The theater is that room, and our bodies are the common trait that gives dance its ancient voice. The right to dance that voice is anchored by discipline and long, hard hours of physical work, day after day, month after month. And if one looks at a career, decades, for the privilege of addressing that audience, nobody understands that outside this art form. Only those that have involved themselves in the creation and interpretation of dance along with those that have helped and supported them can make that claim. It is a knowledge belonging entirely and hermetically to those who have spent their lives testing this commitment over and over again. So when I meet someone in dance on the street or in a cafe or studio, as we've all done, and that person asks, what are you working on? Or what's your new project? If the answer is, something new, a start, the beginning of something, then there will be a look that I've come to recognize. For the briefest moment, it will be as if their eyes were bruised, as they think back to their own beginnings, to the, prince, to the projects that they've begun, to what always comes with each new start. Doesn't matter the technique or the career path, on stage, off stage, there's some universal statement resuming everything and with it, an underlying understanding of the process and how hard that process is. So I say to you, where there is commonality, there is understanding, and with it a potential for support. In other words, we can and should help each other because we are the only ones able to do so. Thank you for your work and for this award.